Good evening, everyone. I'm Deb Henneberry of the 99's Webinar Committee, and I welcome you to tonight's presentation, Amelia Earhart and her legacy at Purdue University. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of tonight's webinar, Sirius XM. And now I will hand things over to Glenda Blackwell. And this evening, we are really in for a very, a very special treat. Our own Deb uh, Henneberry will discuss Amelia Earhart's time at Purdue University in a very personal way. Deb is an assistant professor in the professional flight program in Purdue School of Aviation and Transportation Technology and has had the opportunity to visit Amelia's room and view her artifacts. So Deb serves as the director of the New York, New Jersey section and is the chapter chair of the Greater New York chapter. Welcome Deb. We are very excited to hear what you have to tell us. Um, so hi again, everyone. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about my background and Purdue's background um, and why I wanted to do this webinar. Um, for those of you who already know me, uh, you know I spent uh, a lot of time as an East Coast person, and I guess I always will be at heart, uh, but Purdue wasn't my first rodeo. Um, but I started there uh, back on January 1st of this year, uh, and when I was hired, um, it occurred to me like, in the back of my mind that Amelia Earhart had some kind of affiliation with Purdue. I just couldn't remember exactly what it was. I knew it had something to do with the airplane, but that's that's really about it. That that that's all I knew. Um, then when I started teaching there, in the main administrative building uh, at the airport, I came to realize you know I was teaching instrument and commercial classes across the hallway from where the Electra was kept. So that was a little little daunting. Um, there is a rumor that. Um, Amelia's ghost is still there. Uh, disappointed to say, I have not met her yet. Otherwise, I certainly would have invited her for tonight, but I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, back in March of this year, uh, I was asked to do a presentation for Women's History Month uh, regarding Amelia's impact on Purdue University. And that's when I really started to look into this. And I was just blown away by what I learned because when we think of Amelia Earhart, we certainly think of a pioneer in aviation. Um, but what I didn't know, and I think what a lot of people don't know, is that she was also a pioneer in higher education. Uh, and also, and I won't go into it too much tonight because it would be a whole separate webinar, she was also a pioneer in social work. Um, she uh, had worked in Denison House. It was a settlement house up in Boston. Uh, she had also worked with um, uh, veterans of World War I in Toronto. Um, she worked at a hospital. Um, and if you think back to that time, she actually uh, contracted Spanish flu. Uh, so if you ever see a picture of Amelia where she has a little band-aid on her face, her sinuses were never correct um, after that, unfortunately, and it did uh, interfere a little bit. She had several surgeries. So I was just blown away by just how impactful she could be in so many different arenas. Um, regarding Purdue, uh, in 1930, Purdue University became uh, the first university in the United States to own and operate its own airport, uh, and it was also the first school in the U.S. to offer college credit for flight training. And now I'm sure we know that there's uh, there's many schools um, that do that. So moving on, uh, I know a lot of us know a lot about Amelia's story, um, but I think it's just easiest to pick it up uh, right around the early 1930s. Uh, so Amelia uh, had her solo transatlantic flight in 1932, uh, and that's when she went from being moderately famous to really famous. Um, just before then, she had uh, married George Palmer Putnam, uh, and, and he really managed a lot of her career. So certainly before the transatlantic flight, the second one she did, the one where she was solo, uh, first woman to do it and, and second person to do it. Um, so she was on a lot of speaking engagements. She was traveling the country, um, just, you know, looking into um, why uh, aviation is a good career for women. Why well, actually a whole bunch of careers are good careers for women. And it just wasn't going that way at the time. Um, she was also a big advocate for aviation in general because that was still a hard sell to the general public. So she was doing a lot of speaking engagements like that. But then came the superstar status right after the 1932 flight. And so, you know, the normal size speaking engagements went to the really large size speaking engagements, much larger venues, much more exposure, uh, big conferences, uh, things like that. And that's actually what brought her to Purdue. So fast forward uh, two years after the transatlantic, transatlantic flight, 
Uh, and in the fall of 1934, uh, she met Dr. Edward Elliott, who was the president of Purdue University at the time. In fact, he's one of the longer tenured presidents. Um, he was president from 1921 to 1946. And um, as you can imagine, he made a lot of changes at Purdue during uh, that time. So uh, Amelia and Dr. Elliott were two very like-minded people. And in 1934, they both happened to be attending the fourth annual Women and the Changing World Conference uh, that year was being held in New York City. Uh, Dr. Elliott was there uh, to talk about youth opportunities. And when he saw that Amelia would be speaking, uh, he stayed on to hear her talk about uh, the future of aviation and the role of women uh, as aviation grew. Uh, and suffice it to say, he was he was blown away by what he heard, uh, and he stayed on uh, after she finished her speech and got a chance to speak to her and get to know her um, very well. As it turned out, um, they were very like-minded people, uh, and they, you know, just kept in touch afterwards. Uh, at the time, Purdue uh, had about six thousand students; only eight hundred of those were women. I believe at the time, mid 1930s, Purdue had the capacity to accommodate up to 7,000 students between uh, residential housing and classrooms. Suffice it to say, uh, Purdue is far more than that now. Um, Purdue actually had been opened to uh, female students for quite some time though. So the school was founded in 1869. And in 1875 is when they had their first female student. Uh, they also had their first female professor. Um, they had someone specializing in botany who came to teach at Purdue. And following that, uh, in 1887, the School of Domestic Economy was established. Now that was open only to women, but again, you can see that the, the enrollment in the 19th century of women was, was quite small. So Dr. Elliott had some radical ideas for the 1930s. Uh, he thought that women should be prepared for careers outside the home. And I just think how he's ahead of his time anyway, but also I think that his timing couldn't have been more perfect because as we're talking about the late 1930s, what are we coming up on the heels of but World War II when we really did need women to, to work outside the home. So the timing here couldn't have been better. Um, but in order to increase the enrollment of females at Purdue uh, and to prepare them for these other careers that they hadn't explored yet, he knew that women needed a role model. So following that uh, conference that he met Amelia at in 1934, he kept up some conversations. And in 19, fall of 1935, a year later, uh, he offered Amelia a position at Purdue as a career counselor to the women students and a special advisor in aeronautics. Now it's believed, I don't know if it's confirmed, but it's believed that she was the first career counselor for women at any university in the United States at that point. Um, so right there, she's already breaking ground. Now, when Dr. Elliott did this, he did this as part of a somewhat larger uh, initiative. Uh, so also in 1935, right at the same time, uh, if any of you have an engineering background, you might know uh, Lillian Gilbreth. Uh, she was an industrial engineer with specialties in ergonomics and efficiency. So she was also hired in 1935, and both she and Amelia, uh, they were to um, work as role models with the, with the female students. Um, and in fact, I'm going to read a quote from Dr. Elliott uh, when he officially appointed to her, Amelia, to her new position on June 2nd, 1935, he said, Miss Earhart represents better than any other young woman of this generation, the spirit and courageous skill of what may be called the new pioneering. At no point in our educational system is there a greater need for pioneering and constructive planning than in education for women. The university believes Amelia Earhart will help us see and to attack successfully many unsolved problems. So with everything that Amelia had going on in the 1930s, she was very excited to, to explore this opportunity with Purdue but she couldn't take it on full time. She had too many pre-existing obligations, uh, but she did spend a few weeks at Purdue um, every semester. So maybe a total of up to a month. Um, and as she started to do this, starting in the fall of 1935, she and Dr. Elliott would continue their conversations and continue exchanging ideas on how they could meet their shared goals. So I think this speaks to maybe Amelia as a pilot and Amelia as a social worker, maybe even Amelia that short time that she she served as a, a nurse's aide, but but she seemed to, to um, really operate off of instinct. And she knew that if she wanted to connect with the female students, probably the best way to do it would be to live right with those students. 
Um, so uh, just recently, the first uh, residential building just for women at Purdue had opened. It was called South Hall. It's still there. It's just now it goes by the name Dumi Hall. Um, but it was just for female students. It only opened a couple years earlier. And Emilia moved in there during the few weeks a year she was at Purdue. Um, and this gave her the opportunity really to connect with the students, just to have those shared day-to-day -day experiences. Uh, I heard a, an anecdote about how uh, Amelia, I think she, she might have been looking to put on a little bit of weight. So uh, she was drinking buttermilk quite a bit and she was a little disappointed. She went into one of the dining halls, ordered buttermilk and they, they didn't have it. So wouldn't you know, by the next day, buttermilk is, is like the, the favorite drink of campus. Because remember, Amelia was one of the most famous people in the country uh, at that time. So, you know, when people saw her, they were just blown away. Uh, in fact, there's another story I heard um, where she was in the dorm. She was uh, working with some students and she wanted to, you know, write something down to share with them. And she popped her head into uh, the room next door where there was just, you know, women in their dorm room. And she said, hey, could I borrow a pencil? I'll give it back to you in just a sec. And, uh, you know, oh my God, Amelia Earhart wants to borrow her pencil. And sure enough, she comes back in her sec and the room is just full of, of other students. Just this can't wait to meet um, Amelia Earhart. Um, so she really did get to know a lot of the students and interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you can see here, she used to order uh, offer handyman classes. So she was by no means an AMP mechanic, um, but she was a big believer in being independent. And so just little things like, you know, how do you change a tire or something like that, that she really wanted to share with students so that they would feel empowered. So it was a little casual and unofficial, but yeah, she, she did uh, on the side have uh, her own little courses with students. Now, one of the things that gets discussed the most about uh, Amelia's time at Purdue was was her need to to meet all these students and hear their stories but with 800 women being enrolled at Purdue at the time there, there's just no way and the little bit of time that she would spend there at any you know given period how she could get to know all these students so what she did was she came up with this questionnaire so I've got a, a couple pages of it here um, fairly brief um, but she thought this would be um, sort of an efficient way to to get the stories on these these students that she was living with um, and so uh, she would ask all kinds of questions. So we see a few here. Um, you know, what kind of employment do you want after college and why? Have you decided on a field? If you did so, how did you choose that? Um, there was a good question on the second page here. Um, if you worked, um, you know, just outside the home in a, in a job and your husband stayed at home taking care of all the domestic responsibilities, would uh, you consider him to be your financial equivalent? which was a heck of a question to ask in 1935. That that might kind of go, okay, nowadays, but 1935, no one was thinking along those lines. Um, so that really caught people off guard there. And then she also asked, should women marry after they start working? What, what, what happens with women uh, and with marriage? Um, so we got some interesting uh, uh, or surprising, I guess we should say, results from her questionnaire. Sorry, we'll go back a sec. So what she found out um, was that 92% of uh, the people who answered her questionnaire, and there, there was a pretty good um, rate of being answered, 92% of these women did want to work after they finished college. Um, and funny enough, the, the number one answer was not for financial gain. That, that was further, it was there, but it was further down the list. Um, the number one reason why women wanted to continue working after they finished college was for professional success, uh, followed up by mental stimulation and then also personal independence. Um, so that was very interesting. That kind of appealed to Amelia's mindset, but she was disappointed at the same time um, because as much as she saw these answers, she also saw that 21% of females um, only 21% only of females wanted to work after marriage. So there seemed to be a discrepancy there between the number of people who wanted to work after they finished school and people got married a little younger then, um, and the people who would give up work after getting married. Uh, Amelia chalked this up to uh, women's limited opportunity to experience both work and marriage uh, at the same time. So she really made it her mission to stress to women that first you finish college, then you get established in your career, and then you get married. It's not out of order because what she was seeing was that you'd have someone who was a freshman or sophomore and they were dating someone who was a senior. I say, for example, an engineering school, an engineering student because the school has a, a big engineering background. Um, and she would go right up to this, this, this uh, female college student. And she'd say, hey, 
I know you're dating so-and-so who's a senior. Now, he's going to be graduating and he's going to ask you to marry him. And you're probably going to drop out of school and marry him. And that will be that. Then you'll have kids and you will have never pursued what you were studying here. Um, and so she was, she was very in your face about this, about just something that we might expect more today, almost 100 years later, of do your education, take the time to learn a little bit more about yourself, get to know yourself better, challenge yourself in the workplace. And then uh, if you want to move on and get married, so be it. And we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, but, you know, this was something else that Amelia and Dr. Elliot had in common is that they didn't like the dropout rates that they were seeing. They had, you know, those 800 students, the female students who would begin Purdue, and then they would leave. Um, and then so much for whatever, whatever it was uh, they studied. Okay, so what Amelia was not really hired to do was she was not hired to be a professor or an aviation expert because Amelia didn't really go to college. She did go to Columbia for several semesters. She was pre-med, um, but she didn't complete her degree. She was always moving on to her next challenge. And, and while medicine did interest her, she didn't feel like she would be at her strongest as a, as a doctor. So she didn't have a college degree and she didn't have teaching experience, um, but, she did have her own personal experiences. So during her time at Purdue, even this wasn't really high up on her responsibilities, but she would be invited to be a guest lecturer. And she was actually quite effective at it, even though she didn't have um, that teaching experience. She did have experience with people, uh, I think probably from her time at Denison House and also working with the World War I veterans. Uh, I, I think she had good instincts for people and, and how to communicate effectively. Um, but she would, if you notice in this picture, I mean, people are really locked into her and she's not the normal professor for that class. Um, but she was speaking from her experiences that nobody else at Purdue could speak to. It was her and, you know, one other person who had circumnavigated or excuse me, had gone from New York to Europe. That was it. Um, you know, so she could draw on things and, and share experiences and explain things. No one else had that background. And so she turned out to be pretty effective as a professor. Um, even though that wasn't really what she was meant to do. So every now and then she would pop in um, and give a lecture. But of course, even the lecture she gave, she had to do it Amelia style. Um, so she had a very casual approach. She's a very friendly person. Uh, if you notice here, she's wearing pants. Uh, it was actually mandated at the time that uh, women at Purdue, uh, students and otherwise, would wear skirts. Now that wasn't really a possibility because as we're gonna come to see, uh, she's gonna get that Lockheed Electra coming up soon. And you can't get in and out of these airplanes. It's pretty hard to do in a skirt. Um, you know, we have a lot of wind in Indiana, so that might not work out so well. So she wore pants, which got all the other female students saying, I wanna wear pants too. And then the answer was always, sure, fly to Europe and then you can wear pants. Um, so that caught people off guard. Um, she would sit on a desk. Um, she wouldn't be at a proper lecture podium or anything like that. So, so very um, just conversational with the students, very informal, which also turned out to be um, pretty effective. Uh, in fact, I think that has persevered at Purdue to this day. That that's kind of caught me off guard a little bit. Um, you know, my first day there, I went dressed as a professor, and oh no, <laughs> no, we all dress similarly. We all wear our Purdue gear and you know jeans because you're walking to class in an awful weather. Um, I'm not Professor Hanaberry. I'm Deb. Um, it's really more of a mentorship role, and you know, Purdue's doing what they're doing, and I think they've they've um, caught on to something that's very effective, and. The fact that Amelia did this and it really caught people off guard, I think maybe some of this traces back to her. Now, of course, she did do other stuff that made people go a little side eye. So God forbid she did actually every now and then walk into town, town being West Lafayette, Indiana, and she'd go to a soda fountain and she would do this unescorted. So that was a little controversial. Um, you know, um, actually women kind of pushed back on that just as much as men did too. Although men had the... Um, the added bonus of they felt that Amelia advocating for people finishing their education and going out and starting work and then getting married. He felt this uh, male students evidently felt this this took away from their opportunity to date and uh, and marry at Purdue. Um, so she did uh, overall, and this was true for for actually many many uh, female students at the time. She did note uh, not, not that this stopped her by any means, but she did note that there was a little bit of condescension um, from both male professors and students. Um, now, some of that did eventually break down just from Amelia being Amelia, um, but you know it kind of made sense when she was looking at what was going on at Purdue. There were a handful of women in the engineering program in the 1930s, um, but what would happen is within a year or two. They would drop out of the program because they they just didn't feel comfortable there 
Um, and then they would go on and, and pursue home economics if they were gonna stay on at the school. But eventually Amelia, she did win people over with her friendly approach. Um, and so you see here, even men are checking out uh, her airplane um, and you know, not to jump the gun, but we all know what happens in 1937. So after she goes missing in the 1938 uh, Purdue yearbook, um, there was a dedication to her that said, to our gallant lady whose sole purpose in life centered about furthering women's accomplishments. Um, so she did overall have a very positive effect. She was viewed favorably by her colleagues and the student body. Um, and that was kind of her lasting impression, uh, impression on, on the organization. Um, during her time at Purdue, she did stay in touch with Dr. Elliott. Um, they would continue discussing their mutual interests. The student body continued to grow. Um, the aviation program continued to grow. Um, and, you know, Amelia was actually, through Dr. Elliott, she, she was actually teamed up with some other very notable women. I already mentioned Lillian uh, Gilbreth before, but Amelia actually shared an office with Dorothy, Dorothy Stratton. And if you know that name, it's because she was the first director of the Coast Guard's Women's Reserve. Um, but in the 1930s, she had just gotten her PhD from Columbia University, and she was the first full-time Dean of Women at Purdue. Uh, so she and Amelia also worked pretty, pretty closely as well. So after Amelia had been at Purdue a little while, Dr. Elliott asked her, what's your next move here? What, what, what's any goals? What's your next adventure? And she told them the idea she had of wanting to circum circumnavigate the earth, but at the equator, which hadn't been done yet. People had gone around the, the globe, but not taking the longest route um, at the equator. So Dr. Elliott wanted to support the school, but this is Purdue University. So he also wanted to add a component of academic research to this project. So in 1936, Dr. Elliott began the Purdue Research uh, Foundation. Um, they donated funds for what they called a flying laboratory, which we know as that Lockheed Electra, um, which was equipped for research on long distance flights. So what actually was happening, and we do have this, um, is that Amelia was, was studying the effects of long distance flights on the human body, which there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity uh, for that back in the 1930s. And so what would happen is after every leg of her journey, Amelia would send back documentation, photographs, journal entries from each leg of the trip. It would go back home. Um, you might say, well, why is she jumping the gun here on this? Like, wh why didn't she keep it all with her? And it end up with wherever she ended up in the Pacific. Um, and if you think about it, Amelia needed every little last drop of fuel that she could have. So for weight and balance purposes, she was just offloading everything she could at every stop. So we actually have um, that the last leg that she completed before she set out for Howland Island and then whatever happened there. But that last leg before she left for Howland Island, we do have all that information. Um, and you know, it, it benefited her because she didn't have to have that offset the, the weight of fuel. Um, and then it did make its way back to Purdue University, which I'll get into in a little bit, just regarding our special collections that we have. Uh, but it is kind of neat to see these things that were actually on that last, uh, last flight with her. So anyway, the Purdue Research Foundation uh, did receive a grant for the Lockheed Electra. The, they gave that to Amelia in 1936. Um, as we see here, uh, Dorothy Stratton, she brought female students uh, to see the plane. So there weren't really any females enrolled in any aviation professional flight program back in the 1930s. But here's some of these other students that through coordination uh, with Dorothy Stratton, these women were really blown away. Not only were they seeing this airplane that was Amelia Earhart's, they knew what they were witnessing. Um, you know, they knew something big was coming. Um, so that was a great opportunity. Who knows what seeds were, were planted there. So the one downside is that after Amelia did receive the, the funding in the plane, a lot of her time was taken up preparing for her flight. Um, she was still engaged with students as much as she could, but the thing was that because this was gonna be something that wasn't done before, um, doing research that had never been done before, there was a lot of new equipment on the Lockheed Electra that she was not familiar with. Um, so she had wing de-icers. Um, she had radio telephone systems because she was communicating, um, although not successfully at the end, unfortunately, with uh, the Coast Guard and other people on the surface. Um, and she had newer navigation systems. She, she had a lot to learn uh, while she while she was getting ready for this flight. So um, unfortunately, that did, you know, it's only 24 hours in a day. So unfortunately, there was... Um, there was only so much that she could do with students. Now, 
we know or some of us are still working on what happened in 1937. Um, so that being what it is, um, what's Emilia's lasting legacy at uh, a lasting impact on Purdue University? Well, one of the big things is that she was a big proponent for the integration of men and women in classes. Um, so when I spoke before about the condescension that she and other female students were experiencing, she thought that if men and women could sit in class together, that might help uh, combat that, um, which of course now there are male and female classes integrated at Purdue. Um, she inspired Dr. Elliott to be aware of further challenges and obstacles experienced by the female students. He was very tuned into it as we discussed uh, for the 1930s, but she really enlightened him with what she was finding out through her uh, questionnaire. Um, and then most interesting is that in the year following the announcement of Amelia's appointment at Purdue, the number of female students doubled. So that was one of the first times we saw a big struggle for accommodating the number of students who wanted to attend Purdue because they momentarily hit capacity and then, then had to work on that. Um, after Amelia was no longer at least in contact with Purdue University, um, in 1939, um, Dr. Elliott did continue on with some of the things Amelia had advocated for and believed in strongly. Um, so he began a liberal science education program. This is today what we would call STEM. Um, so back in 1939, 95% of women would stay home and raise children after they went to college. But this liberal science education program would provide an alternative path for women who wanted to pursue male dominated fields like engineering and agriculture. Um, and really, the message from Dr. Elliott and from Purdue through this program was that women were just as valuable as men in both engineering and society, which is what we're still working on today. Um, so I'm going to take a quick pause. Um, Glenna, do you have any questions? Um, actually, Deb, I just checked the, the chat and I don't see any questions. If, if anybody has one, uh, please uh, feel free to, uh, to write it in the chat just now and we can get Deb to answer it. But this is so interesting. It's, it's, so, uh, it's all new information. I, I never knew these details as probably many of us haven't heard. Thanks for sharing, Deb. Oh, absolutely. I, I was in the same position um, six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to share some of the things that I've seen at Purdue. Um, and um, there are some people that, are, that need to be thanked for this. So of course, uh, George Palmer Putnam, um, he was responsible for the collection of the Amelia Earhart papers. Um, after that flight that, that didn't quite make it to Howland Island, uh, he, he did have, um, aside from um, the tragedy of, of losing a beloved family member, um, you know, he did have to work on getting her um, legally declared dead. Um, and then after he got through all that, then he was able to start sending things to Purdue. Um, so the Amelia Earhart collection started growing around 1940. Um, and then one of his granddaughters, um, Sally Putnam Chap uh, Chapman, uh, she donated hundreds of additional items more recently. Um, so the, the um, collection has continued to grow. And I also want to personally thank Sammy Morris um, from the Special Collections uh, at Purdue because she was able to sit down and show me some of these things. So this one I was really excited about. Uh, now, let me just say I had on those white cotton gloves, but this is the helmet that per that Amelia wore when she was doing her transatlantic flight. Um, and there it is right at Purdue. They, they have it put away, but um, they, they, they can bring it out uh, on request. Can't really touch it with your bare hands or anything, of course, but um, it's in great condition. Um, so that was, that was neat to see. Uh, here we have her goggles. Now, now these can't um, these can't be touched. They're in a box, um, and if you look right between, um, let's see, right here where those two pieces for your eyes meet, that's you know it's coming up on about ninety years old now, or hundred years old. Um, so these are getting kind of fragile, so they can't endure being taken in and out of the box. So they just stay in the box um, because they have kind of worn quite a bit. Um, uh, but they don't know exactly. She had a few pairs of goggles. They don't know exactly when she wore these, but this is one of her uh, sets of goggles that she wore. And then what I found really interesting is Amelia would get a lot of questions about when you were doing those long haul flights. Um, so she did that flight, her first flight 
uh, across the Atlantic when she was really just a passenger. And she wrote a book about it um, not long after that. And then when she was solo across the Atlantic, um, didn't take quite as long, but still a very long flight. People would say to her, well, you know, what would you, what do you eat or drink? You know, because that's too long to go without eating or drinking. Um, so back then they didn't have cans like we have now. So if you think like you have a can of soda and it's got the pop top, which you can pretty easily open, they didn't really have that yet. So what she would do is she would take tomato juice because she thought that was kind of hearty. And it would just be in a can that you normally need a can opener to, to open. Um, but of course, if you're busy flying an airplane, you can't start with a, with a can opener. Um, so she would take an ice pick. And during her flight, she could you know, kind of stab the top of, of the can and drink tomato juice during the flight. Um, so this is an, one of the ice picks that she had used for one of those flights, which I thought was, uh, was pretty neat. So these are three of my favorite things that are in the collection, um, but there's a lot more than this. Some of it's out on display. Some of it's just copies of things on display just so that they don't get um, you know, any kind of damage or deterioration from light or anything like that. Um, but um, over the years, um, members of Amelia's family have sent private papers uh, like we saw, um, well, it wasn't really private, but the questionnaire, there was a lot of papers like that. There were transcripts and audio recordings of speeches she gave. Uh, gave. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this. This was something else. I think I'd maybe heard this at some point and forgot, uh, but Amelia actually wrote a lot of poems. Uh, sometimes she would write them under pseudonyms. Um, she would create a male pseudonym that wasn't too far off from Amelia Earhart, um, but they have copies of those. Um, they have things like flight logs. So like I was saying, the journals from her flight across the Atlantic, um, that, that's available too, um, to, to be seen. Uh, and I thought this was pretty neat too. So this is Amelia's transport pilot license. Uh, so th things worked a little differently back in the 1930s. She, I don't wanna say she needed this specifically for anything she was doing, but it certainly was a professional credential which served her well. Um, so, so here we have a copy of her, of her transport pilot's license, kind of neat. Um, and then regarding, aside from the special collections, what of Amelia's is still at Purdue today? Well, I already spoke about um, the, the building um, at the airport where her Lockheed Electra was housed, where she worked. Um, that's, uh, I believe that has historical, historical landmark uh, status nowadays. Um, so you, it's, it, you, know, you look at it and you see it, it does look kind of like what we saw in those pictures uh, where she was walking around in the 1930s. It does kind of look like that now. Um, in 1964, um, Earhart Hall was opened. That's a, a, it's a residential building. Um, in 2009, one of the trustees um, created the, uh, uh, this, donated this Amelia Earhart statue, um, which I think is kind of nice because if you look in Amelia's left hand here, there's a dining hall right behind where the statue is. And I like to think that students leave Amelia uh, homage so sometimes you'll be walking by the statue and you'll see cookies or a bagel or a banana. So often enough, you're seeing food that gets left for her and it just kind of fits nicely right in her hand here. So it's kind of nice to see her still having dinner with the students. That's kind of cute. Um, this is the the room that she stayed in. Um, so back then it was called South Hall. It was a it was a fairly new building. Uh, nowadays it's called Doomy Hall, um, the first residential hall for women at Purdue. Um, so now it's kind of more like a lounge. So I, I took these pictures uh, from two different uh, directions. So you can kind of see with the fireplace, you can see how it would have been a nice room at the time. Um, and you can kind of see with the table, you can almost envision her kind of sitting there working with students, uh, giving them advice, mentoring. Um, and then there's a collection of some pictures um, just regarding Amelia um, and things associated with her. Um, so one thing that I really enjoyed seeing was this plaque um, just kind of commemorating her time at Purdue um, and just her love of learning and passing it on. And then one other thing that I, that I think will mean a lot to, to people here tonight is there's a little uh, write-up about the 99s. Um, they talk about the Powder Puff Derby in 1929. Uh, they talk about how Amelia was our first president. Um, and then they talk about how the 99s have grown. So they talk about how the 99s got their name. And granted, this, uh, this document is a few years old now, but they were saying we've now grown, we're international, uh, coming up on 6,000 people, which of course we're beyond that now. Um, but it's kind of nice to see. Um, and there are, uh, as far as the female student body goes, there actually are many 99s right in, in the uh, 
professional flight program at Purdue, which is kind of nice to see. Um, so if anyone is interested, um, this is the link. And if you just go to this link, you'll actually be able to uh, access produce online special collections regarding Amelia Earhart. Um, I do want to stress that this is not the only special collections they've have. They have at Purdue because uh, there have been a lot of well-known people, very accomplished people associated with Purdue. So things about Neil Armstrong. Uh, you only have to take uh, two steps at Purdue and you're reminded that every giant leap starts with one small step. Um, so it is nice to be in, surrounded by greatness like that. Um, but you will find other special collections um, at Purdue. So I encourage you, you know, if you want to find out a little bit more, um, you can also visit Purdue um, and, and see these special collections in person. It is kind of neat just to get a little bit more uh, personal connection with Amelia. Oh, thanks, Deb. Thanks so much. Um, Putnam had a granddaughter, question mark. Did he remarry after Amelia or was she not his first wife? Do you know? Uh yeah, I know that he she wasn't his first wife. Oddly enough, um, when they first met, um, this was a, uh, a little bit of time before she did that first flight across the Atlantic because because he helped arrange that. And so they they kind of through connections got um, introduced to one another. Um, so he was married at the time. And uh, Amelia really hit it off with uh, Putnam's first wife. Um, they had been married um, several years. Um, and I forget if they had two or three children. Um, we probably know Amelia did not have any biological children of her own, but from everything I've read, she did have a good relationship with her stepchildren, even though Putnam and his first wife ended up getting divorced. And of course, Amelia's good friends with the wife, um, not long thereafter, um, George Putnam and, and Amelia get um, uh, married. Um, but from what I've read, and of course, um, we'd have to ask a, a member of the family, but I don't think there were too many bad feelings there um, just because of the way Amelia kind of conducted herself. Maybe it's just one of those things. I don't know, uh, maybe somebody else knows. I don't know if, if George Putnam got married um, after uh, Amelia went missing. Uh, it doesn't stick out in my mind, but he did live, oh, I wanna say another 15 to 20 years after that. Um, and now he has, by the way, he has multiple um, grandchildren. Um, I think someone had even, one of them had even signed up for tonight. Um, but yes, there are members of the family. In fact, one of the stepsons just passed about 10 years ago. So, so there are many of them still around. Um, Deb, uh, Shannon Osborne did us a chat and say that he married shortly after Amelia um, was officially pronounced dead. So he was married three times. Thank you, Shannon. Well, that's uh, all I see. And Deb, this was very exciting. I'm thrilled um, that you were able to give us all this information. And um, I'm glad everyone was able to join us. Thank you for, for participating. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your summer. And uh, Glenna and I will see you in September for the next webinar. Thanks again, Deb. Good night. Good night.